Hello, everybody. Um, so the past few weeks, we've been talking about um, Genesis. Whenever you've seen me up here, we've gone through chapter one, the creation week. And then we delved into the creation of man in week number two. And to be honest with you, if Genesis had ended after chapter two, God could have finished with the famous line that many fairy tales finish with. Adam and Eve were the best man and woman that you'd ever seen. They had a perfect home, perfect environment, but as we know the Bible's not a fairy tale. It's an account of the history of man, where we came from, and why we need a savior. No one really knows how long Adam and Eve were in perfection before the fateful bite. We're just told in Genesis 3 that paradise was lost. And with that, we're going to pray, and then we'll go into the scripture. Lord, we thank you for the chance to meet together again. We thank you for the chance to study your word, to learn about our origins and how you paved the way for us to make it back to you after the um, fateful bite and... um, we ask, Lord, that you would um, glorify our time, be glorified by our time here, that you would um, help us to better understand your word, that you would um, just help us to open our hearts, minds, and ears and receive, most importantly, what you would have us to receive from what we talk about tonight. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Genesis chapter 3 we begin, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman said (coughs) unto... Sorry. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord... (coughs) And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above the cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. 
And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam and to his wife the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So there's a, the reading of um, Genesis chapter 3. And as we kind of go into this, as we kind of start breaking it down, we're going to look at the characters that are in play here. We're going to look at the um, situation that takes place and what God kind of has to do as a result of Adam's sin. So we'll just kind of start right at the beginning. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, and right there, starting, God's casting, or Satan is casting doubt about what God actually said. Ye shall not eat of the every tree of the garden. Now, let me ask you this. What would you do if you were out working in your vegetable garden, cutting your grass, um, or your wife was out working in the garden or cutting the grass and came in and said that a snake had started talking to her? It would probably at least make you a little nervous. I know for me, I'd probably freak out a little bit. This kind of makes me think, anyways, that before the fall that the animals could actually communicate with the people. This isn't the only time in scripture that um, animals have communicated with people in a verbal sense. If we look on to um, Numbers, we can see that um, Balaam's donkey talked to him as he was heading off to curse the Israelites. And another extra biblical account, a book that was actually mentioned in the Bible, the book of Jasher tells of a, a wolf that was given voice to um, talk to um, Joseph. So Hatton Eve encountered talking animals before. I don't believe that she would have readily conversed with the snake and listened to what the snake had to tell her. Um, so as we move on past looking at the serpent itself, we um, go on into the temptation. Now, as I said in the opening, no one really knows how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before um, the fall. We're just given the course of events here. And the woman said to the serpent, we, shall, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, 
neither shall you touch it. God didn't say that. What we have here, what I like to call what we have here, is the first actual case of legalism in the Bible and in Christianity. God just said don't eat it. He never said anything about not touching it. I don't know if this is the way Adam explained it to Eve later on as she as he was maybe teaching her some of the things that God had told him before the she was created or if she just made this up on the fly as she was talking to the serpent. But um, this little phrase here, neither shall you touch it, helped to contribute to Eve's downfall because Satan just kind of, or the serpent just kind of kept taking it from there and there and just kept wheeling her in, lest ye shall die, which is also not what God said. Now the serpent, he's feeling pretty bold at this point. He got her to misquote what God said initially, so then he throws something out there that's pretty close to what God said, lest ye shall die, and he realizes that she doesn't even maybe know what she's talking about. So now the serpent outright lies to her and convinces Eve that God's trying to keep something good from her. And we, I mean us, everybody watching out there, we can't really get too upset with Eve here. After all, how many times have we allowed ourselves to be convinced that um, we're somehow missing out on something if um, we don't do what the world does. How many times are we made to feel like we're missing out on something because we don't grab that can of beer, because we don't sleep with that person, because we don't max out our credit cards, or something, whatever your thing may be. How are we Many times have we been made to feel that we're missing out, so we might make those little compromises. And then we don't even see it until we're left to deal with the consequences. Moving on. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat also. And the part of this verse that I find the most disturbing is the part that says that her husband was with her. He was the one that was supposed to be probably teaching her. He was her spiritual leader. He was supposed to be protecting her and guiding her. So what was Adam doing? Was he kind of doing maybe what uh, we might do with our siblings when we're younger and ornery, like, I'm just going to sit back and watch and see if what God said actually happens. Um, or did he try to dissuade her? Did he do nothing to dissuade her? Um, we, don't really, we don't really know, but um, I find that a little disturbing. But it also sets up a formula that um, deceived Eve, but it's the same formula that Satan would uh, later try on Jesus. It's the same formula that he continues to use on us today. It's a three-pronged formula. And it goes something like the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He told Jesus, make 
bread out of stone to relieve your own hunger. He, using scripture again, twisting scripture just like he did with Eve, he tried to convince Jesus to jump off of a tower and the angels in Psalm 91, 11, and 12 would uh, keep him from striking his feet on the ground. He was using scripture, but he was using it wrong. And then the third thing, worship Satan in return for all the kingdoms of the world. So just like Eve with Jesus, and just like with us now, the lust of the eyes, I want it. The lust of the flesh, I need it. The pride of life, I deserve it. This formula continues to be used today because it's a successful formula. We fall for it. We'll at least fall for one of the three every now and then. Our common enemy, he's not afraid to uh, twist scripture, misquote scripture, throw, just throw a, a word in here or there. One of the things when I was teaching youth down in Dayton that I tried to point out is one simple word, one simple letter in the Jehovah's Witness Bible changes the whole thing. In 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, our Bible, of course, says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Their Bible throws one word in there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Once again, Satan trying to throw, just misuse scripture, throw one letter in there, change the whole thing. And sometimes that's why we have to, as Christians, know our Bible. We should be reading our Bible. should be reading it more than we are, at least speaking for myself, I should be reading it more than I do. So I know there's some instances in my own life where I was doing something or I was told something, sometimes by people that I considered reputable Christians or trusted friends, and something in my spirit just didn't sit right. I couldn't put my finger on it, and at the time that it was, at the time that it was, I was trying to process this, I couldn't biblically tell you why it was right or wrong. But then I would get home and I'd get that reaffirmation through a scripture, maybe not right away that day, maybe a month later, maybe um, two months later, maybe that day. Um, and I would see the scripture that would line up with why that didn't sit right in my spirit. So even when you're reading and maybe something's not making sense to you at the time, as Pastor Paul mentioned on Sunday, the Bible's living. You can read it one time, maybe it doesn't catch, doesn't stick. Read through it a second time, maybe it's still no catch. Maybe the fifth or sixth or eighth time you read through it, it clicks as to why and it takes on a whole new meaning to you. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. But the sad thing here is talking about Eve, and Eve was deceived by the serpent. She kind of bought into what he was saying, hook, line, and sinker. Adam should have known better. Adam was talked directly with God. God gave Adam these orders directly. He sinned willfully. But can we, can we blame Adam? Can we blame Adam for the world we live in today, for the problems that we deal with? I'd say that we also can't blame Adam. We couldn't really blame Eve. We also can't blame Adam because truth is, eventually, we would have made the same choice he did. Adam, and we've all done it in the past. We've chosen 
other things when we should have chosen God. Even things that we know are sin. After Eve sinned, Adam had two choices. Follow his wife, follow God. He could continue following God and turn her down, or he could turn his back on God and go with what the go with what um, his wife wanted. When I was a youth counselor and a youth pastor earlier, I'd see this all the time with teenagers. Some of them seemingly on fire. They'd be at the church every time the church was open. Every time we had an event, they were there to help out. Whether it was helping to serve a dinner or just for a service, they were always there. There, at some point, came a time, and mostly when they got to that age, they would either get with a guy or get with a girl and start dating, and they slowly began to fade away from the church, doing whatever, um, going to games, either that or they would say they had, the one I got a lot was, I have a lot of homework to do. And my response was always, do your homework on Saturday. Um, come to church Sunday morning, you got all day. Well, if the person that the teenager was dating didn't want to come to church instead of them pulling their prospective mate up they usually were pulled down which is kind of what happened with Adam we also see it among adults I mean how many of us how many times have we seen adults compromise on um, different things. I mean Romans 12 or yeah Romans 132 warns us about this and I've also seen this people seemingly Bible believers will compromise the word of God because their family member, their loved one, their friend got involved in some kind of lifestyle that's not pleasing to God so instead of um, holding their loved one accountable they kind of join their friend or as Romans 132 says they approve of what their friend um, is doing it's so moving on though and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons symbolizing our futile attempt to hide our sin or to try to make up for our own sin and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him where art thou and he said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself and he said who told that who told thee that thou wast naked hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So in spite, okay guys, keep this in mind now, in spite of the fact that Eve ate first of the fruit after being tempted by the serpent. Adam was the first one that God questioned. As God created man to be the head of the household, he was ultimately responsible for
for the care and the guidance of his wife in spiritual matters. Well, in spiritual matters, but also in all matters. Um, my wife has a saying that she likes to use sometimes that tell, tells me I'm the head of the household, and if I'm doing something wrong, sometimes it's her job to tell me, and sometimes it's her job to just let it go and just duck when I have to receive correction from God. Um, but this is also where the blame game starts. Adam doesn't want to take the blame, and he starts passing the buck to Eve and eventually to even God. Then Eve, she passes the blame on down to the serpent. It's kind of like, have you ever seen one of the cartoons in the past where um, they're all kind of lined up there and someone asks the question, like, who did it? And each one's pointing down to the next one in the line. And then uh, they finally get down to the serpent, and he's got nobody to point to. So the blame gets passed down to, from Adam and to Eve and God. It's the woman that thou gavest me. She did it to Eve and then Eve to the serpent. Eve, and one thing to notice here too, how quickly Adam throws his wife under the bus on this one. He didn't try to protect her from the serpent. Now he didn't try to protect her from the, her, the consequences that God may have for her. He threw her under the bus. He's not getting blamed for this. So Eve, after Adam was questioned, then God simply questions Eve. But she doesn't, he doesn't go through the whole litany like he did with Adam. He simply asks her, what did you do? And like her husband, she wouldn't accept responsibility for her actions. It was the serpent. When God got to the serpent, he already knew. Have you ever seen a... I'm, I'm trying to picture what a serpent looks like with legs on it. Anyways, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle, and above all the creatures, every creature, <clears throat> and above every beast of the field. Upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So at this point, God's done with the serpent. And you've got to throw this in there. The serpent literally didn't have a leg to stand on at this point. But... Um, God's really merciful at this point. He questioned Adam and Eve about what happened. He dealt with the serpent, and he moves on to the promise. So before he gets to the penalty, he moves on to the promise. He wants kind of the good news before the bad news. And I will put enmity, and in the promise, he's also um, giving Satan telling him what's going to happen to him. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He predicts the perpetual hostility that's going to be there between Satan and the woman, in this case representing all of mankind, and between thy seed, Satan's agents and his little minions, and her seed, the coming Messiah. It shall bruise thy head, Satan's defeat on the cross, and thou shalt bruise his heel, speaking of the sufferings that Christ would have to go through on the cross. So, and at this point, I'm going to add, not, neither Adam and Eve, not even Satan, knew what the plan was. If Satan knew what it was at the time, he could have timed it just like a interception, like a cornerback timing the quarterback's throw to run the interception and stop it. Satan didn't even have a clue at this point what was going on. He 
started figuring out that, okay, there's going to be more people. One of them's going to kind of disrupt my plan. So I'm going to go through different things that um, you'll see as you read through Scripture. And in an effort to thwart God's ultimate plan of salvation. We've seen it happen, and we'll talk about it in the next chapter. A few other highlights. We've seen it happen with Moses, and um, he actually thought he defeated Jesus on the cross. Until surprise, he walked out of the tomb. So this was kind of the whole scenario of giving the good news before the bad news, because... Um, now, God's going to deal with Adam and Eve, and they're going to kind of find out the consequences of their disobedience. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. So, by stating multiply, that means there was always going to be some kind of discomfort as women were to give birth. But um, this is talking about through the whole labor period, all of the um, pain, sometimes the drawn out periods of labor, the whole um, pregnancy period, the birth pangs, the... Um, I'm trying to remember all the things my wife went through as she was carrying Elena. And a lot of that was one of the consequences of um, Eve's sin. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This, is, this part's um, controversial. It's confusing. There's a lot um, of people that say a lot of different things about it. In my own research, I'll, I'll say what I've kind of come to believe about this is uh, looking up the Hebrew word for desire is Teshakwa, which I know I'm not pronouncing that right, but um, it's used three times in Scripture. It's used um, in Genesis 3, it's used again in Genesis chapter 4, in talking about um, when Cain and Abel are having, or when Cain is upset with God for not honoring his um, sacrifice, which we'll get into next time. And it's also talked about in the Song of Solomon. So, um, Teshakwa, or the desire shall be to thy husband, desire most likely is translated to control your husband. Otherwise, too, why would um, it say you'll desire your husband and he will rule over you? If God wasn't trying to get the point across that um, this is what this means. And it's called uh, the scriptural word for it, or the um, theological word for it, is called an antithetical parallelism, where the opposite thing is said in the first part of the verse and in the second part of the verse. Um, a lot of the commenters will point to the similarities, again, between Genesis 3.16 and Genesis 4.7. 4.7, um, and I'm not going to go through the big diagram of what I read and saw and all that, but it says, If thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, sin's desire to control you. And thou shalt, and thou shalt rule over him. Don't, that's like a whole other lesson. So, moving on, God's done talking with Eve about the consequences of her sin. Moving on to Adam, he said, 
because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And much of this sorrow is physical work, I think, that we have to do and the toll it takes on our bodies, back aches, muscle cramps, blisters and calluses. And even if you think now, well, people got it easy, they got cushy desk jobs and computer jobs, they got a line of problems of their own. They get back aches from sitting too long. Long stress headaches from staring at a computer screen all day. Then there's just the stress in general of if you got a desk job, you're probably responsible for something and you probably have a lot of stress to make sure that whoever's under you is doing what they're supposed to be doing or whether it's going to be falling on you to have to go do if you're in any kind of a management position. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And so prior to this, that tells me that the plants, even the roses that we get for our wives on Valentine's Day and birthdays and stuff like that, they didn't have the thorns or the prickly things that stick us. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. Instead of the food just being right there, Adam would have to go out and work for it, work a lot harder than what he had to uh, um, work when he was in the garden where he could just go pick an apple off of a tree and, and um, didn't have to do the back-breaking labor to cultivate the crops and to um, deal with the thorns and thistles as he's pulling the weeds out and stuff. In the, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat the bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was taken, for the dust thou art, and dust shalt thou return. So God's kind of reminding Adam there, this is where you came from. As a consequence of your disobedience, this is where you're going back to. One interesting thing I saw as I was reading through this is the only thing that's actually mentioned as a curse is the ground and the, and the creation is cursed. But a lot of this is the consequences of the sin that Adam and Eve had committed. And in addition to receiving their own consequences, they also, as we go on today, have, um, we kind of, because we're all together, because we're meant to be a unit, we have to kind of deal with each other's <laughs> consequences as well. I mean, I don't know. I tried to look up numbers on this. I couldn't get anything um, real reliable. I mean, on average, how many even small arguments or disagreements do you have with your spouse during the week? It's kind of all a consequence of um, Eve was the one that was said that she would have a desire to usurp her husband's authority, but man also has to deal with this. Adam had to deal with this, and it's something that carries on today. On the other side of it, Woman's got to deal with, especially going more out into the work force now, she's dealing with a lot of the backache, a lot of the stress, a lot of the headaches, a lot of the physical effects that were so taxing on Adam as well. That, not only that, but she's also his helpmate. So she was going to, she kind of ends up with it not only from now going out in the workforce, but she was always his helpmate, so that was going to be part of her thing, too, if she had to do any gardening, if she had to go out and hunt food. So the after effects of all this, and it all sounds really, I mean, it's all, it all sounds really bad, 
But Adam, despite throwing his wife under the bus, despite passing the blame off on her, despite even kind of just sitting back while she sinned, he gave her a very loving name. He called her Eve because she was the mother of all things living. And God, at this point, comes around and shows his forgiveness and his mercy. Unto Adam, also unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of the skins and, the, and clothed them. This is very symbolic. This talks about the coming sacrifice that Jesus Christ is going to make for him on the cross and in a few thousand years. It also is symbolic because it shows that there has to be death and there has to be blood and sacrifice in order for the forgiveness of sin. Don't get me, don't get me wrong here. It's not the animal sacrifice, as we found out throughout Exodus and throughout the Old Testament. It's not the animal sacrifice that gets the sin forgiven. It's not the blood of the animals. That's a preview. That's a sign of what's to come and a sign of what God will be doing in the future as his son will eventually make the ultimate sacrifice coming to earth and dying on the cross so that we, by his blood, can be cleansed. God clothed them, and he'd forgiven them. At this point, though, there were still more consequences. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed him at the east of the Garden of Eden. Remember, when we talk about east, we were saying last week that whenever we're talking directions in the Bible, that the center point is always Israel. It's always Jerusalem. So he set the garden at the east. Now he's driving Adam and Eve even further east. And then he put the angels with the flaming swords to keep them out so that they couldn't come back. And this seems pretty harsh until you think about it. Had God allowed them to stay in the garden at this point? Had he allowed them to stay there? One of them was eventually going to bite into the tree of life, and then he was going to live forever in a decaying, in a now unglorified body. And today, Adam and Eve would be 6,000 years old, and they would be miserable because they um, would be dealing with the same aches and pains that a lot of people start to accumulate as they get older. They would be dealing with all of the illnesses, and um, they would be stuck living with no way to escape from the body that they were in. So God was actually really merciful when he put them out of the garden. But that mercy, again, that wasn't the end of the story. God was already in Genesis 3.15 planning his redemption and planning a way for us to get back to him. 
He did this because he loved us, and he wants us to be with him. And if somebody is out there watching who has never made that profession, if somebody out there wants to know more about this, we urge you to um, to pray, to contact someone here at the church, to would be happy to talk to you. Um, we urge you to come to know Jesus Christ, which is our way back to um, paradise, well, God's new paradise, which is going to be the new Jerusalem and the new earth. But without Jesus, you're stuck. So again, if anyone out there wants to know more about Jesus, contact someone here at the church and they would be happy to talk to you. And with that, we're going to close in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for being so honest about why we're in the state we're in. Thank you for being so honest about who you are and who our ancestors were. Thank you for loving us enough to give up and to send your own son to die on the cross for our sin. Certainly something none of us deserve. But you so willingly did it because you you loved Adam and Eve and you love all of the us that came after them. Lord, as we go forth tonight, we want to lift up um, those in need. We want to lift up some of the prayers for some of the conversation that took place before this video started. We want to um, lift up our own families. Help us as men to be the spiritual protectors that we need to be for our families, for our wife and for our kids. Help us to glorify you and help us and guide us to better understand the things that we need to understand, that you want us to understand. And help us to always be about your business. Lord, we ask all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.